Good morning, everyone. So welcome to another webinar of UK Importers Hub. So for those who don't know me or for those who are new to our webinars, my name is Nisha Menon and I'm the director of Nikasu Foods and founder of Jack and Chill. So we have been importing Indian frozen food products from my factories based in India, Kerala, into the UK for the last 15 years. And um, I have been running a Facebook group to support similar importers and uh, startup entrepreneurs as well to learn more about importing and ask many questions you have, which is called UK Importers Hub. So if you're not part of the Facebook group, please feel free to join the uh, Facebook group UK Importers Hub. And I also run a YouTube channel, which was launched uh, during COVID, which is called Nisha Menon Business Talks, where I share my experience of importing into the UK, my learnings of uh, throughout the journey as well. Today, it's a very important topic, which is what we're going to talk about is about GS1 barcodes. So many of you might know GS1, they are the people for creating barcodes, especially the authentic barcodes required for many of the retailers and, uh, you know, and the wholesale sector as well. So we've got, we are joined by Ben Clark, who is the training manager for uh, GS1 UK. And the structure of the webinar today will be, we'll have half an hour of the presentation. And then after that, we'll go through the questions we have in the chat box. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat box and we'll pick it up in the end. So welcome to the webinar today, Ben, and uh, it's you, a pleasure sir. to have you on board. Over no, to thank you, you. Thank you for inviting me and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so as Nisha said, my name is Ben Clark. I'm train man training manager at GS1 UK. Happy to be here today. Thank you for joining. And today's session, we're going to be talking about why GS1 barcodes are essential for your business. So what we got lined up for you today, can tell you a little bit about who GS1 are and, and what we can do to support your business. Why am I here talking to you about barcodes as opposed to someone from any other organization? And then we're going to talk about our numbers and what they can do for your business. And finally, we're going to touch on barcodes, you know, my favorite topic in the whole wide world. Um, hopefully you guys get into barcodes a little bit more as well. Um, as Nisha says, we welcome questions. We will try and answer them as we go along. I've got my colleague Dan here keeping an eye on questions. So please, if you do have any, just pop them in the question box and we'll, we'll try and answer them as we go along. But if not, we should have some time at the end of the presentation. Um, so let's talk about who is GS1. We're a not-for-profit member organization. And what we do is we work with industry to set standards. And those standards are in place really just to help businesses work a little bit better with each other, uh, help things move across the supply chain, help inform consumers and protect consumers. You know what standards are basically, everyone working the same way for a greater benefit to make things safer, to make things better, to make things easier. Our standards primarily focus on the supply chain. And how we got started, there were some US supermarkets who got together with their major suppliers because they were sick of doing things differently for each other. They had conflicting demands. They had to identify their products differently across, across the supply chain. And it causes confusion. It adds to cost. So all these suppliers and retailers got together and said, this is silly. We need a common way of working. So in the early 70s, all these competitors got together and they agreed on a common barcoding standard. And somehow all these competitors did that in less than a year. So I'll always kick off with a little bit of trivia. Sharon Buchanan was the first ever person to scan a barcoded product in 1974. So play along at home. Can you guess what the first ever barcoded product was that was scanned in Ohio? in 1974. So if you come away from, with nothing else from, from this webinar this morning, you've now got a fun fact for, from all the family. It was a pack of Wrigley's Juicy Fruit was the first ever barcoded product scanned in 1974. And that same pack of gum is in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington to this day, unchewed. Uh, so maybe you can pay pilgrimage to it because we see barcodes absolutely everywhere these days. We really take them for granted. We only really notice them when they don't work. So it's estimated there's about 6 billion GS1 barcodes scanned every day all around the world. 
So if you walk in any supermarket or local store, pick up a product, have a look at the barcode, 99.9% .9 of the time, that will be a GS1 barcode on that product. Now, GS1 is a global organization. We're based in 116 countries around the world. There's a GS1 India, GS1 China, GS1 US. You can join your local GS1, get local support, hear about the standards in your own language, but the standards you implement, the numbers, the barcodes will work globally. You don't need to join different GS1s all around the world. You can join one GS1, get local support, implement barcodes in that, that country, but they will work internationally. And it really doesn't matter what industry, what sector, what part of the supply chain you work in, anyone can use GS1 standards to improve what they're doing as a business to try and make their supply chain a little bit more efficient. And that's why there's over 2 million companies around the world using GS1 standards to move their products to trade online or offline in all different sectors. When it comes to the standards, there's basically three parts to the GS1 system, and we call it identify, capture, and share. So the identify bit, if you think of a company, you've got all these different things in it you need to identify. It might be a product, might be a case of those products, might be a pallet, might be a distribution center or warehouse. When you use names or language to describe things, it can get really confusing for your um, supply chain partners, especially when they speak different languages or they have their own code to identify things. So what GS1 of them, we said, don't use a name to describe that thing. Don't make up a number. Why don't you use one of our unique numbers? Because they're standardized and globally unique, the numbers which we assign to our members will not get mixed up with anyone else's numbers anywhere in the world. So the numbers we give you to identify your products will work globally. Everyone knows what to expect. They're unique to your organization. Now, GS1 have got numbers to identify coupons and pallets and assets and companies and locations, but most people join GS1 to get numbers to identify their products. And that's what we're going to be talking about in today's session. We've also got standards for barcodes and data and EDI and all sorts of different things just to help businesses and the supply chain keep moving. And the best way to look at it is really like a common language because you're doing it this way and distributors and consolidators and this retailer in India and that retailer in the US and this government agency and that hospital, you know, once everyone's doing it the same way, it makes it far easier to do business. You get fewer conflicting demands. It makes it easier to move products. It makes it easier to share information about that product as well. So just by working together, using the same language, the GS1 standards, it should make your businesses and supply chain a lot more efficient and cut down a lot of the variation and cost in your own supply chain. Now, as I mentioned, 99.9% .9 of people join GS1 to get numbers to identify their products. And this is why it's useful to do so. So we got an example from the medical device world, three medical device manufacturers doing three very different products, but they've all happened to use exactly the same catalog number. Now that number is really important to Medtronic or BD and, and j and j It's important to all their internal processes and systems. It's in that spreadsheet and this database, and it helps them with their internal processes. However, if I'm a hospital, I can't order via that number. I can't do stock counts or inventory management. And importantly, I can't do recalls via that number because it's not globally unique. I don't know which product it relates to. We get similar sorts of issues with language as well, not just with codes and numbers, we get issues with language. So if I search for my favorite breakfast cereal here in the UK, I type shredded into Google, 
I'd be very disappointed if I got some underpants turn up instead of my favorite cereal. You know, language can cause problems. It's ambiguous at the best of times, but when you bring in different cultures and different languages as well, you know, it, it can cause, you know, confusion across the supply chain. So how we get away from these sorts of issues is through the allocation of GTINs, Global Trade Item Numbers. These numbers are basically just the number which you see underneath a barcode. If you pick up a product in your local shop and it has a barcode on it, the number underneath it will be a GTIN. And a GTIN is simply a number which you can use to identify a type of product which you sell. It's as simple as that. It doesn't matter what industry or what sector or what point in the supply chain, if there's something, some type of product you need to identify, you can do so with a GTIN. So this is what we call these numbers here at GS1. We call them GTINs, but unfortunately your customers, the supply chain marketplaces tend to call them different names. You may have come across the phrase EAN numbers, UPC numbers. Um, so you have to be on your toes a little bit. That's what your customers may refer to these numbers as. But at GS1, we call them GTINs. They're exactly the same numbers. These numbers you can use to trade online, offline with anyone who's requesting an EIN or UPC number. So why use the GTIN? Well, we like to think of it as a passport. You know, just like a passport enables you to be identified and travel the world. Think of a GTIN as doing the same thing for your products. Once it's got a GTIN, you can use that same number for all the retailers you trade with, regardless of the market, regardless of whether it's online or offline, the GTIN tells you it's this product. That's all it does. A GTIN says it's this type of thing. And once that product's identified, you can use that all over the world, all the different markets which accept GTIN. You don't need to do different things for retailers, different retailers. The GTIN identifies the thing. So you don't need to allocate different GTINs depending on whether you trade with retailer A or retailer B. They all accept that same number because it identifies this thing. And what does it do? The GTIN is just a unique key to information. That's all it is. The number on its own doesn't do anything. However, it is a unique number which enables you to access information. So that's why data is so important. All a GTIN does is enables you to access information which is held in a database. So you guys are the owner of this data more often than not, and your retailers need this information and trading partners and distributors the GTIN enables all your different um, trading partners and everyone across the supply chain and consumers to access this information. Data is king. The GTIN is the unique reference number to be able to access all this data. And who uses it? Well, pretty much everyone. Any retailer online or offline that normally sells products from different brands, different companies, tend to use GTINs. So all the major players like Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, some major retailers here in the UK like Tesco, Sainsbury's, they all require GTINs to identify products. If you were a retailer just selling your own products, then fine, you could do whatever you want. You can make up your own numbers, choose your favorite barcode, and you know it would work in your store. However, if you've got hundreds, thousands, or millions of products like Amazon, you need a unique identifier for those products. And that's where the GTIN comes into its own. But just to reiterate, the GTIN identifies your product. So I can allocate a GTIN to a product and could sell that product to all these different retailers detailed here with exactly the same number. The number just tells you it's this thing. And traditional retail or bricks and mortar, you know, we've been using it now for nearly 50 years. For starters, you know, it helps you at point of sale. It enables you to sell this thing at the till. 
but it also enables you to do purchase to pay. So your invoicing, your purchase orders, dispatch notes, things like that. If you can say it's this product, it's far easier to do ordering and invoicing if it's got a unique identifier uh, within the purchase to pay process. It's important to note that although your customers can use these numbers for inventory management and supply chain visibility, we want you guys to benefit from these numbers too. You know, it should make your processes easier. It should make your inventory management easier. It should certainly make the traceability process easier from your end as well. If you can categorically say it's this product and it's identified with this GT. And if you think about traceability, all the different parties that have such a major part to play in traceability, should anything go wrong, being able to categorically say it's this product, here's a number to identify it, then should anything go wrong and that product needs to be recalled, then it's quite easy to do across the supply chain because everyone is referring, it to, referring to it exactly the same way. You get better visibility, transparency and traceability across the supply chain if everyone is referring to products exactly the same way. But it's not just bricks and mortar. Obviously, e-commerce is growing exponentially around the world and the marketplaces need to use these numbers as well. It enhances the customer experience. It makes search re uh, relevancy far more accurate enables you to bring together reviews and price comparisons because it's the GTIN telling you it's this product. There might be 10 different sellers of that product, but it can congregate them all together and offer you the price comparison and reviews for that one product because the GTIN tells you what it is. Because the GTIN should be allocated by the brand owner, it should reduce counterfeit products as well, duplicate listings, things like that. So we recommend, obviously we recommend the GTIN goes in a barcode on a product, but that shouldn't be the end of it. Whenever you list a product online, include the GTIN in the data set, include the GTIN in the attributes for those products. And then for things like Google Shopping, it will increase impressions by 40%. You know, so that's an extra 40% of people who've got eyeballs on your product. And because there's more people viewing your product online, you're going to do more conversions as well, more sales, 20% more con conversions. So this is proven just by adding a GTIN to your Google shopping feed. And to give another example, if you use your GTIN on eBay as well, again, it enables you to pull reviews through from the web. You know, people rely on reviews more and more. People want to hear what your peers think about this product before making a a decision about buying it. The GTIN enables you to pull through all this additional rich content for this specific product as well. And if you include it in eBay as well, it goes through um, to the Google shopping feed as well. And yet eBay will be paying for that. So it's just a no brainer. Include the GTIN everywhere you are able to. So some of the basics now, that's sort of the why you allocate a GTIN, but how do you actually go about it? How do these numbers actually work? Well, it's normally the brand owner's responsibility for getting and allocating these numbers. If it's your product, your name on it, you're legally responsible, you get the GTINs. Go to your local GS1, come to GS1 UK, become a member, you'll be assigned a batch of numbers which you can allocate to your products, and then you just renew annually. So give your numbers to your products as and when you need to. So if someone's doing contract manufacturing for you, you should be giving them one of your GTINs. They shouldn't be providing the GTINs because it's not their product. They're just doing a service for you. Whoever's brand it is should be applying for and allocating the GTINs. If something's got a GTIN or barcode on it, then just use it. Use it throughout the supply chain. There's no reason to change that number. However, if you're doing anything to that product, if you're repackaging it, you're relabeling it, you're putting it together with something else in a bundle, then that would require a new GTIN because you've just made it something new. And then you can't reuse GTINs. 
you know, things live forever these days online. And if you've used that GTIN on something else, even if you don't sell that product anymore, if you go and reuse that GTIN on something else, then chances are there'll be two web pages out there with two different products and the same GTIN on there. It causes confusion. So never reallocate any GTIN. If you retire a product, the GTIN should be retired with it. And it's absolute basics, but you need a new GTIN for every different variation of thing which you sell. So if you've got three different flavors, that's three GTINs. If you've got different net content, so 100 gram bag versus 150 gram bag, then that's two different GTINs as well. If they're available in cases and inners and shelf ready packaging, you know, different levels of packaging require new GTINs as well. Because all a GTIN does is tells you it's this thing, it costs this amount, it's this big, it's this heavy, it's got these ingredients in it, it's got these allergens in it. The GTIN tells you all this rich, important information. So if you need to distinguish one product from another, you need to give it a different GTIN. Okay, so you can go through numbers quite quickly, particularly if you're doing clothing, for example. If you've got five different styles in five different sizes, you know, that's five times five, you know, 25 GTINs. So every different variation of product you need a new GTIN for. So net content, this is exactly the same product for 500 mils versus one liter. It's just a different thing, new GTIN. And then you'd need a GTIN to sell this bottle at point of sale, but your customers, the retailers are ordering at this level. So they need a different GTIN to say, this is the box of 12 bottles that I want to purchase. So you're gonna get through numbers quite quickly if you have got a lot of products, but it is so important that you have a different GTIN for every different thing which you guys supply. And here's an example from the retail world I mentioned. Every different combination of size, color, will require a new GTIN. So you can categorically say that it's an extra large blue T-shirt versus a medium T-shirt. They're different things. So GS1 have got rules around how you allocate these numbers in the first instance, which is pretty straightforward. You need a new number for every different thing. But we also have rules around when and why you need to give new numbers out so if you make certain changes to your product you will be required to give it a new number so we've got some guiding principles to help you guys to make decisions on this so the first one is do the consumers or trading partners need to distinguish between the old version of the product and the new version if they do you should be giving it a new gt the second one is the change you're making affecting any regulatory or liability disclosures? If it is, then that's some significant stuff there. You need to give it a new GTIN. And the third one, is the change you're making significantly going to impact the supply chain? If it is, give it a new GTIN. So these are things you guys should have in mind. If you're changing a product, can I answer yes to any of those things? And if you can, you should be giving it a new GTIN because you've changed something really important, something fundamental about that product. And by changing the GTIN, it enables all your customers, the supplier chain, retailers, their listings to be updated with the new information. So let's give you a couple of examples. So I've decided to introduce a bonus pack of chocolate bars. So play along at home. Do you think you should give a new sheet into that product? The correct answer would be yes. Any net content change requires a new GTIN. So forget bonus or forget free. If you've got two extra Kit Kats in there, then you've changed the declared net content. Any net content change requires a new GTIN. Even if it was only a gram, you'd need a new GTIN. 
Okay, so I've got exactly the same product and I've decided to sell it in South America, North America. Would I need to give those products new G10? The answer is no, keep the same G10. The G10 identifies the product. It tells you what it is. Just because I'm selling in a new market or with a new retailer, I don't need to necessarily allocate it a new number. The GTIN just tells me it's, it's this cookie. However, if I need to change that packaging for the new market, so if I need to change language on there, or there's different regulatory requirements in the EU versus the US, then I should be giving them new GTINs. The GTIN tells me it's the French versus the Mandarin version. It enables you to make sure the right product gets to the right market and the right information is displayed online. So if it's exactly the same product, keep the same GT. If I need to distinguish it for regulatory or language requirements, then it should be different GTINs. So what do you reckon if I added a certification mark to a product? So this one causes some confusion or disagreement normally, but if I add a certification mark to a product, I should give it a new G10. Because basically you are saying that this product is now you know, certified by some sort of third party body. So it could be Red Tractor, it could be Fair Trade, it could be Kosher, it could be Organic. I am basically saying that you as consumers can now buy this product with confidence because it's been certified by this particular body. If it wasn't that way before and it is now certified, you need a GTIN to indicate that fact. So I, as a consumer, know for a fact that I want to get the certified version versus the non-certified. I want to make an informed decision about that. So if you add and by the same token, remove any certification marks, you need to give that product a new G10. And this one, so the same amount of shampoo in the bottle, I've decided to reduce the, same, uh, the size of the packaging. The size of the bottle's been reduced. So what do you reckon? New G10, keep it the same. Well, this is a tricky one, catches a lot of people out. That would be a new GTIN. Because you've changed the height of that bottle by more than 20%, you need to give it a new number. So people have got 20% leeway to change the size of their packaging up or down, and they can keep this number the same. But anything more than that, it needs a new GTIN. So this isn't talking about net content, this is just talking about the size of the packaging. This also applies to gross weight. If your packaging gets 20% heavier or lighter, you need to give it a new GTIN. Because if you think about it, retailers need to know this information to know how many they can fit on a shelf. Or consumers might need to know this information. Or it affects how many you can get in a box and things like that. People need accurate data. But manufacturers, brands need a little bit of leeway. So industry decided that 20% seemed about right, seemed about fair. So we get lots of questions about this GTIN rules at GS1. We can help you guys as members. If you change your products, get in touch if you're not sure whether that product needs a new GTIN or not, because it can cause major issues with your retailers if you don't change your GTIN when you should. If you think about problems allergens can cause in particular ingredients, things like that. So please get in touch with your local GS1 if you need support on that. So we talked about numbers. We're now quickly going to talk about barcodes. So what is a barcode? It's just a data entry technique, really. People think barcodes are magic and it's got loads of information in there. It's got the name of the product. It's got the price in there. But really, all that's in that barcode is that number underneath it. A barcode is just a visual way for a machine to understand that number. It's just a data entry technique because humans are rubbish at typing in things. We're rubbish at data entry. We're not very quick. However, a computer is brilliant at it. So a barcode is just really cheap 
efficient, accurate data entry technique. And it's so good, but it was voted one of the top 10 inventions that changed the world. I love this list, although you shouldn't look too closely at it, or you might wonder, well, where's the wheel and the internet? And what on earth is trainers doing on there or PlayStation? But we're not going to argue with the British Science Association because barcodes, they do a job. They really haven't changed in 50 years because they are so effective. Now, there are loads of barcodes out there, hundreds in fact. And if you're using barcodes internally in your own organization, in your own business, it doesn't matter what you do. You can make up a number, it doesn't need to be unique, and you can pick your favorite barcode and away you go. You know it will work with your system. So boarding passes for planes, tickets for concerts, things like that. You can do whatever you want. You know they'll work for you. But if you need a barcode that works for everyone, the whole supply chain, or your retail partners, that's when you need to start using standards. So GS1 have got specific barcodes which can be used across the retail world. This is the most common one you'll see anywhere, the most common barcode, the EAN or UPC barcode. So most of the world uses EAN barcodes with 13 digits. In the US, they use 12 digit barcodes, the UPC. It doesn't matter which one you use, they both work at point of sale all over the world, no problem at all. If you need a barcode for a case, so 12, 24, 48 in a pack, we've got a barcode which is perfect for printing on poor quality material like cardboard called the ITF 14 barcode. Now, both of these barcodes, all they hold is a GTIN. That's all they can hold. And then you're relying on that GTIN to pull information from a database. However, sometimes there's extra value in putting more information right there in the barcode itself. And to do that, we've got something called a GS1128 barcode. And this barcode enables you to put lots of extra information there, like best before dates, batch numbers, serial numbers, lots of information right there at the point of scanning. And more and more retailers are requesting these barcodes because you can see the value in having this extra information, the better traceability, the better stock rotation and the inventory management it enables you to do. Particularly if you do short shelf life products or food, things like that, these barcodes are invaluable to your supply chain. But I think they're valuable to all sorts of different industries or sectors. And if you're interested, that's my favorite barcode. So as well as choosing the correct barcode for where you want it to be scanned, GS1 can also advise on all the best practice to make sure it works because there's plenty which can go wrong with barcodes. They need to be the correct size, the correct color, the correct placement, the quality needs to be good enough. So again, GS1 can support you with all of this, with training, how-to guides, barcode checking services. We also have partners who provide you with software and printers and labels, that sort of stuff. So please come to us for support. Um, so I'm hoping some of you are GS1 members, maybe with GS1 UK, if not with GS1 India. But I'm hoping you're GS1 members somewhere because um, as an organization, we offer you guys support to get it right. We offer you experts in your local marketplace, your local area, retailers, all this insight. Because we work for industry, by industry, we're able to provide you insight. We don't work for the retailers. We work with them, demand and supply, to ensure that everyone's doing it right, because standards only really work if the community are doing it correctly. So we are quite often have experts at a local level who specialize with local retailers, food service, construction, technology, marketplaces, um, whatever is important in your local area, GS1 Offer has expertise to help you guys implement the standards correctly. We tend to have support lines, training, ways for you guys to manage your numbers online, and as I mentioned, partners to actually help you implement our standards. So please get in touch, become members if you aren't already. 
Um, so that's a real whistle-stop tour of who we are and what we do. So lots of people do think, well, barcode numbers are not important. I can just buy a number off eBay. Um, I would just like to assure you that GS1, as Nisha mentioned right at the start of this presentation, we are the only place to get authentic, bona fide, genuine GTINs, barcode numbers. If you obtain numbers from anywhere else, the numbers may not be unique, they may not belong to you, they won't be traceable. And there's a very good chance that people like Amazon and Tesco will reject your products and ask you to relabel them because those numbers don't relate to you. So I'm not trying to scaremonger, just to reiterate that GS1 is the authentic source of these numbers. And as a member organization, we can support you with so much more other aspects to help you get it right for your business as well. Um, so thank you for listening. I don't know if you've had any questions through or, or Nisha, if you'd like to say anything. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, for the uh, great informative presentation, actually. There were a few things which was quite interesting to know as well, like, you know, the shape, the size of the packaging reduce and you need a new G10, which is, yeah, which people might not know. Lots of people do not know that. No, yeah, you're, you're yeah. spot on. Exactly. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot, um, Ben. And I think uh, at the end of it, that was one question which I keep getting in the group as well, and which I've seen many people, they go for these cheaper barcodes, especially in on eBay, and yeah. then they get into trouble because, uh, you know, so it doesn't get scanned properly or get rejected by Amazon. So I think from uh, the group's personal experience as well, and from others as well, I think that's the reason I would highly recommend it's worth getting the GS1 membership, uh, you know, for those who are watching this yeah. video. I and, mean, on that, on that point, Nisha, um, Amazon actually check numbers with GS1 to say, uh -huh. does this number belong to this brand? Oh, okay. And they quite often delist products if it doesn't match up. And the other issue is if you do get numbers from somewhere else and list your product and then need to change it down the line to a genuine GS1 number, you're going to lose all that listing information and all that lovely reviews and sales information because there's no way to transfer one GTIN to another at the moment with Amazon. So oh. please get the numbers from GS1 in the first instance because otherwise it's going to be a very painful exercise to, to sort yeah, it out afterwards. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks, Ben. And also, if you become a member of our group, you know, GS1 has kindly offered a special discount for the membership as well. So uh, please feel free to get in touch with uh, GS1 and quote UK Importers Hub for the offer that you will be getting as well. So I thought I'll just mention that. Uh, over to Dan, do we have any questions or if you guys have any questions, please feel free to uh, you know unmute yourself and then ask Ben directly. Uh, no questions yeah. quite at the moment, no. Okay. Well, hopefully, because it was nice and clear, and you all know exactly what's going on, um, or maybe you're all barcoding and experts already, so that would be good. But honestly, any questions, any confusion, any support we can offer you, please get in touch. We'd love to, to hear from you guys. Yeah. So uh, thank you all for coming in today and uh, attending this webinar. And thank you, Ben and Dan, for organizing this uh, webinar. And thank you, Ben, for coming and sharing the information on the presentation as well. It was really glad to have you guys on board. So um, as I mentioned before, this, record, this uh, webinar is recorded and uh, we'll send you the copy of this uh, recording by email and um, GS1, Ben's and Dan's uh, contact email as well. So until next time, all of you take care and then have a great day. Thanks, guys. All the best. Bye-bye.